Senator Hunt, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. The kernel of what this conversation is about is the portion of AM 911 on page 2, lines uh, 2 through 17, which appropriates about $5 million to the Department of Corrections for site selection and planning. It's clear from conversations with colleagues under the balcony, over the interim, throughout this year, that I don't think most people in this body support building a new prison. From the progressives to the conservatives, a lot of us have our reasons for saying this type of appropriation isn't something that we actually support or think is best for our communities. But appropriating this $15 million for research into site selection, research into um, the structural integrity of the prison we have, uh, to me, this type of compromise, which it is, it's a compromise with the executive branch, we might as well consider it going to the prison. I don't understand what the significance is of the nearly $15 million that we have to work with in our budget, giving that to corrections as, you know, we'll be able to provide some oversight, but to my mind, it's basically a blank check to them to begin the process of site selection and engineering work and whatever to build this new prison when we have not yet committed to building the prison. We see our prisons as de facto homeless shelters, detox centers, mental hospitals, instead of actually investing in housing, healthcare, education, etc. And so I respect the work of the Appropriations Committee. I hope that they know and understand that and that I've said that enough to them. And I also understand the political reality of where I sit left of center and the people I represent in Midtown Omaha for the most part. Um, I get, I've gotten dozens of letters encouraging me to oppose the construction of a new prison. And so I'm in a very comfortable, safe place saying not one dollar for incarceration not one dollar for more prisons, um, that we need to decarcerate and rehabilitate. And that is what I believe, and that's what I'm going to stand for. That's what I campaigned on, and it should not be a surprise to anybody that I'm saying this. Um, just as it's not a surprise to me that the people on appropriations who have made commitment to be a team player, um, that they are doing their best to make a compromise, they could have appropriated the whole amount to the prison and they didn't. Instead, they are giving this small $15 million amount to work on site selection, to do a study, whatever. As many people have said throughout the day here, I don't think that what we need in Nebraska is another study. I don't think that what we need is more research into what we can do to decrease our prison population instead of building a new facility. Uh, we cannot build our way out of this problem, but there has not been the will in this legislature to pass policy that will address this problem. And I would also say, perhaps if Director Scott Frakes is so desperate for funds for this prison, maybe some of it could come out of his obscene salary. Scott Frakes received a 30% raise this year. It upped his annual pay from $192,000 a year to $250,000 a year. And that increase makes Frakes, who's had this job for five years, one of the highest paid correctional officers in the entire country. And I can't conceive of a reason to give somebody like Scott Frakes a $60,000 raise when our prison staffing is out of whack. One minute. When our prisons are one of the most overcrowded prisons in the entire country. I'm sure if you ask the staff of these prisons, they could certainly take a raise. We have so much trouble attracting and retaining people to work in our prisons and staff them to say nothing of an entirely new prison. But we give a 60,000 raise to the, to the guy who's running it. I don't have any budget to spare for a prison, but I have plenty of money to spare for prevention. And we know that a lot of prevention that we can do doesn't even cost anything but we still can't get support for it in the legislature. I would suggest to Senator Arch in particular, who stood up and talked about, you know, we're all open to compromise and I would like to hear solutions. 
we don't have to reinvent the wheel, folks. We don't have to invent the wheel. There are places and countries. Time, and Senator, but you are next in the queue. You may continue. There are countries and there are cities and there are states and municipalities that have figured this out. There are academics and researchers who have gathered the data, who have made this their life's work to study what we can do to decarcerate people and lower the number of people in our prisons. And we can apply that to Nebraska. So what am I talking about? Well, one free way that we can reduce the prison population in Nebraska, free, zero dollars and zero cents, is we can allow people who are formerly incarcerated with drug convictions to apply for food assistance to receive SNAP benefits. This is something specifically that Health and Human Services Chairman John Arch has blocked and will continue to, I have no doubt, despite that speech. In 2019, this was my priority bill. And if we had passed that in 2019, all of these people over this past year who applied for food benefits in Nebraska during the pandemic and were denied which I hear all the time um, from organizations like Together Omaha that they've had to turn people away um, or, or they've had to give services to people who are turned away by Health and Human Services because they have a drug conviction from like 1998 or something. So now that they're in a dire consequence, they're not eligible to receive food assistance. And colleagues, year after year after year, we have the opportunity in this body to do that for these people so that they don't recidivate, so that they don't turn to crime in order to support themselves and their families. In 2021, my bill to do this is LB-121. It's on general file now, and we are going to have plenty of opportunities to take it up. Uh, Senator McAllister's priority bill, I want to say it's 108. I think his priority bill is 108, and it's, um, it addresses the snap cliff effect. My bill to help people who have been incarcerated and help them receive snap benefits could easily be amended onto that bill if people like Senator Arch and Senator Moser and Senator Dorn and others who have said, well, we want solutions, but you just got to bring them to me and I'll support them. Here's one that you can support. Let's get that passed this year. And we know that this is going to help people from becoming incarcerated again. Expanding SNAP access for formerly incarcerated people instead of pushing them toward reoffending, it'll also result in cost savings for the state. We know this because a person in Nebraska who is convicted of a drug felony typically spends an average of 1.6 years in jail. This is a figure that's knowable that we know. The average cost to incarcerate a person in Nebraska is $35,950. So that's a total savings to the state of almost $60,000. According to the fiscal analysis provided by the Department of Health and Human Services, this regulation change would result in costs that were so minimal that the department could absorb them. And of course, we already pay taxes to the federal government to fund Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, so it wouldn't cost anything to the state taxpayers either. By not implementing policies like this, not only are we putting people on the path to reoffending, but we're leaving federal money on the table. Our neighbors in Kansas, Missouri, South Dakota, Iowa, Kansas, Colorado, they're taking these federal funds that we're leaving on the table. And by doing that, we are actually doing a disservice to our taxpayers who are paying the taxes to get these benefits. And then our governor and our legislature says, no, 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 we don't need those benefits. Give them to Missouri. Give them to Kansas. Give them to Colorado. Give them to Florida. One minute. That is fiscally irresponsible. We all want to make research-based policy decisions, and it's clear where the research is urging our state to go. It's wrong that someone who could get convicted of possession of cannabis at age 18 would be unable to receive SNAP benefits 15 years later if they needed them. And this bill would correct that. Um, you know, you'll have the opportunity to support this bill on Senator McAllister's SNAP bill. If you want to do something to address our prison population and advocate for smart justice solutions, we all agree that this is going to take many pieces of the puzzle. I have a seriously impactful, measurable, proven piece of that puzzle, and I'm holding it up for you. And colleagues, I would like you to take advantage of the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. President.
Thank you, Senator Hunt. You are next in the queue. You may continue. Thank you. Expanding SNAP access for formerly incarcerated people instead of pushing them toward reoffending will result in so many savings to the state. And this is measurable and we know this. And it also becomes clear what a great injustice this is when you realize that someone who could have served time for robbery, burglary, murder, rape, any other type of offense at all, bank robbery, child molestation, that those people are eligible to receive food assistance once they've served their time. But if they have a drug conviction, they cannot. We feed our prisoners. We feed the people who are incarcerated. We make sure that they get food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner when they're in the prison. So the ban on food assistance for drug offenders who are released must not have to do with their status as a criminal. It has to do with their status as a drug offender. And if that's the case, we have to ask ourselves, what is it about having a drug offense that makes them so morally reprehensible more than any other crime that we are going to allow everybody else to receive food assistance, apply for food stamps, get SNAP after they've served their sentence, paid their debt to society, but not drug offenders. A collateral consequence of this is a legal disadvantage. or a disability that occurs by operation of the law because of a conviction, but is not part of the sentence for the crime. These consequences, like ineligibility for SNAP, are basically an invisible punishment. Courts are not notified to tell people when they get convicted that not only are you going to have to serve time for the drug offense, but you are never going to be eligible for SNAP after this. It's like another punishment that people don't even know about. So for many drug offenders, it comes later and they find out the hard way that they're going to continue to pay for this crime for the rest of their life by being unable to access food assistance, even though other formerly incarcerated people are allowed access. And of course, we're talking about drug crimes. Uh, South Dakota, uh, Colorado, of course, it's going to be a blink of an eye until all 50 states have legalized recreational cannabis. Which don't get me started on that because I don't have enough time. But how are we denying these basic rights to people who have been convicted of a crime that in most states in the country is no longer even a crime? This is all to emphasize how the choices we make in here snowball until we get here until we get to AM 911 when we have to apply for $15 million, or not apply, we have to appropriate $15 million for site selection, for planning, when we don't even have a commitment to build a prison. We're saying we're not committing to build the prison, to say nothing of the money set aside. It's not putting Senator Kavanaugh on her committee that she did the work to start. It's not passing bills like my LB-169 or my LB-121 to support drug offenders to receive food assistance so we can stop recidivism. We're, people in this body say we don't want a new prison, no new prison, but here's $15 million for you to think about it. On top of your 30% raise, Director Frakes, because you're doing such a good job thinking about it. This is not conservative. This is not even tough on crime, because we know that so much recidivism is a direct result of our policies that we pass here in the legislature. So we own this problem just as much as anybody else. One minute. And Senator Hunt, this is your third opportunity. Thank you. What this is, colleagues, and what this is, Nebraskans, most importantly, is this is politician behavior. It's politicians saying, we're going to do a study, we're going to gather the data, we're going to do the research, and once we find out what's best to do, we'll convene a committee and we'll come to an agreement about the course of action that we need to take. What that is, practically, is it's kicking the can down the road when we have the power and the information and enough data to act today. We don't need to collect any more information. I don't have any questions about whether or not it's the right time to build a new prison. For me, I have no budget for a new prison. I have lots of budget for prevention, but that's not the conversation the rest of you are willing to have. Thank you, Mr. President.